Good morning and a special welcome. A uh, special welcome also to those who are viewing us online. Um, to our members and visitors alike, please remember or, or fill out the uh, We Care card that's in the uh, pew in front of you. Uh, for any visitors, there is an excerpt about the Holy Communion in the uh, front of the bulletin. And if you agree with those statements, we invite you to join us for Holy Communion this morning. Um, I have a few uh, announcements. There is a uh, facilities planning committee that is forming. Uh, the first meeting will be held tomorrow, May 16th at uh, 6.30 in the upper room of the Family Life Center. And you can see the happenings uh, in your bulletin for more details. Uh, also, Pastor Moore will be conducting a care training and devotion during the Sunday school hour next week in the fellowship hall. Um, we will be having a Memorial Day celebration after the late service on May 29th. See uh, the happenings for more uh, information there. Uh, also, our uh, Vacation Bible School is open for enrollment, and um, so any that would be interested in helping out there or, or attending, uh, please uh, see the uh, bulletin also for that. Uh, Pastor Moore, do you have anything? Okay. Uh, in that case, may the Lord bless our worship together today, and uh, please rise for our opening hymn, number 815. Alleluia, Alleluia, hearts to heaven. We call upon the presence of God to be here with us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With God in our presence, we have to recognize our unworthiness, and so let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. 
Amen. We pause for a moment of personal prayer and confession. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue now with the service of the word, reading responsively Psalm 148, read responsively by verse. One of my favorite psalms in the entire Bible. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Let us pray. O oh God, you make the minds of our, your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18, and can be found on page 919 of your pew Bible. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7, and can be found on page 1041 of your pew Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord.
Please stand to honor the words of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does it mean? Uh, what does he mean by a little while? Do we, not know, we do not know what he is talking about. But Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourself? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now profess our faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our sermon hymn. Him 722, Lord, take my hand and lead me.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Special welcome to those of you joining online, wherever and whenever that may be. Again, if you're watching live, do us a favor and share that feed. Uh, that is your way to invite your friends to church. I want to give you guys a peek behind the curtain, right? I've been here uh, as pastor at Christ Memorial uh, about a year and a half, give or take, which equals, give or take, about 70 to 75 sermons that I've preached over that time. And as I've shared my process, when it comes to Sunday morning, I get up at 4 a.m. Because I am not a morning person. Boy, if church was an evening thing, you guys would get an entirely different preacher. I tell you that right now. But I have to essentially trick my body into thinking that, like, right now is lunchtime, right? In order to be awake enough. But there's another reason beyond just that that I get up so early. See, I get up at 4 a.m., I get my coffee or, or two or sometimes three, and, and I just sit there with my blank notebook in front of me, and I write out my sermon. It's not that I haven't written my sermon throughout the course of the week. No, what I do is I sit down without consulting any notes, without consulting anything. I just write out what's in my head. And usually it lines up with what I've worked on throughout the course of the week. But the reason that I do it that way, it's taken many years to kind of land on that process. And I assure me, I assure you that I wish that it was different. I wish that I could sleep in a little bit more. I wish that, that I could, you know, on Saturday night, have, be able to have a little less anxiety. But I found throughout my career that if I write out a manuscript, if I write out a word-for-word -word manuscript, I struggle when it comes to preaching it. Like the words that I'm saying right now have never actually been put to paper. Here's why. Because I, when I do finally write, I, I write an outline form. And the reason for that is I want to leave room for the Holy Spirit. I want God to be able to speak to me and through me to inspire in any given moment to say something. Because I trust that the Holy Spirit is at work through this process right here. And now that does add some anxiety into my life, but I, I do like to you know, leave room for the Holy Spirit, which is a, kind of a funny saying. Uh, those of us who grew up in Christian schools, that was what we often were told like at high school dances, right? Leave room for the Holy Spirit. Make sure you're not dancing too close, which we knew. We were like, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a size. He can, it's fine. Uh, but that idea of leaving room for the Holy Spirit. And I pray today as we sit here as we worship, as we join together online, that we're able to do that. That we're able today to leave room for the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to even perhaps even speak through us today. With that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today, for this chance where we can come together and worship you. Lord, I pray that you focus our hearts Focus our minds on you here today as we see God, you, and your full identity, Father, Son, and yes, Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for the chance to share your message. I submit myself to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in a powerful way. I pray that everybody who hears these words, your words, would also be willing to do the same, to submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, that you could speak to each and every one of us to tell us exactly what we need to hear. Lord, we ask you to speak and that you would give us the focus and the strength to listen. In your name we pray, amen. Now, part of the reason I had that kind of early diatribe there about the Holy Spirit is if you look at our readings for today, there's, there's a focus in some ways on, on the Holy Spirit, right? We see in our gospel reading, we see Jesus, he, he yet again has a teaching that his disciples don't understand, and he tells them at some point the Spirit will help you to understand this. You're, you're not ready yet, you're not there yet, but at some point the Holy Spirit will inspire understanding within you, will open your mind's eyes, so to speak, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. And of course, we, we kind of rag a little bit on the disciples at times for not getting what Jesus is talking about. Sometimes, yeah, that's, that's worth it, right? Like, because he says some pretty plain things and they're like, well, I don't know, Jesus. But then sometimes you have readings like today where he says like, for a while I won't be with you, but then I will be with you again. And you can kind of understand why the disciples are like, what is he talking about, right? And so basically Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is going to work in you 
to understand these parables, to understand these rather complex sayings at time. Then we have our Revelation reading, which doesn't explicitly mention the Holy Spirit, but heaven knows if you have spent any time studying Revelation, uh, there's a mysterious spirit about the whole book. It is, you, you need the Holy Spirit to open your own mind's eye and be like, God, I'm looking at seven lampposts. I don't really know what's going on. Holy Spirit, could you inspire me to understand what's happening in this book of the Bible? We know that it can be a mysterious and difficult to understand book, but we also know the Holy Spirit is at work. Um, as we saw in today's reading, as the old has gone and the new has come, talking about how there will be a new creation, the Holy Spirit working within each and every one of us to inspire that faith and understanding. But the one that I really want to look at is our Acts reading today, Acts chapter 11. Because I, I love the narrative that's shared there. See, what we're looking at is we're looking at the early church, like early, early like Easter just happened, early church. And they're still kind of trying to like find themselves. They're still trying to figure out who they are. Because for the understanding of the people there, Jesus came and he was the Messiah. He was the fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, of scripture, right? They didn't have the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet, right? They just had the Bible, uh, scripture. And so Jesus was just a continuation of that. And they're like, that's great. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for our daily life, right? What does it mean to go from literally following Jesus, following him from town to town, learning from him, learning from his teachings, to more metaphorically, spiritually following Jesus? What does that mean for us? And for many of them, they kind of settled into the fact that, that, that this understanding of, of Christianity was essentially an extension of Judaism. It was, it was the next step within the life of Israel and the life of Israelites and their relationship with God. And so they looked back at the Torah, at the law of, of what we call the Old Testament. They looked back at the Levitical law from Leviticus, and basically they said, well, we, got, we still keep that. Well, that's where we find ourselves when we come across this Acts chapter 11. Is Peter, is, he's in the midst of ministry, and he finds himself having meals with Gentiles, with people who would be considered to be unclean. And so the people who are still trying to keep the Levitical law are like, Peter, what are you doing, buddy? You're supposed to be one of the religious leaders. You're supposed to be one of the people who are, who are establishing the foundation of this new journey of, of metaphorically, spiritually following Jesus. And yet, you're breaking the law, Peter. And I love the way he responds, because he doesn't necessarily argue with them. He doesn't say like, oh, well, here's the deal. No, instead he says, let me tell you a story. And he tells a story about how he had this vision of this sheet coming down from heaven with, with animals on it. I love the fact that the Bible explicitly mentions reptiles. Like, what a strange thing to include in there, uh, which would seem odd to us, but if you've never had alligator tail, ooh, it's delicious, um, which I guess is an amphibian, but nonetheless. Okay. And so he sees this, this cloth coming down with all the, these clean and unclean animals, and basically he hears God's voice that says, eat. And in his mind, he says, well, if this kosher law is not necessarily being overturned, but it kind of has this new chapter, then perhaps that's true of all of those laws that we see there. Or at least that there's some level of flexibility, perhaps. Because then he goes on to say, as he finished this vision, suddenly these Gentile guys showed up. And God tells him to go with them. Again, something that they were unclean. They weren't supposed to be with them. And so he does. And he proclaims God's word. He actually references back to Pentecost, something that we'll be celebrating here in the modern church in just a couple weeks. Uh, references how the Holy Spirit descended upon them as tongues of fire, right? And he says, basically, it happened again. And the Gentiles were the recipients of this, and they believed, and it was powerful. And I love the line that he says. I just love this. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? Basically, this is Peter saying, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Jewish guys, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I understand that there are certain laws that we should be following. There's a certain way that God has designed things. But when it comes down to it, if God's going to tell me to go and talk to these Gentiles that are considered unclean, I'm not going to argue with him. 
right? The, these things that they're holding on to, this wasn't just we've always done it this way. This wasn't just like a tradition that they held within the Jewish faith. This is, is decades, centuries, even millennia of something that was so integrally part of their spiritual lives that was explicitly stated in Scripture, and yet it seems as though God's going against it by telling him to go and speak to these Gentiles. And again, he says, who was I that I could stand in God's way? I've shared with you before how, how God called me into ministry. I never really wanted to be a pastor, but, but God spoke to me through a number of people, through, through a, a very interesting occurrence on a hillside. Um, and it, when it came down to it, even though it necessarily wasn't my first choice, who am I to argue with God? If God's calling me to do this thing, then <laughs> I feel like I'd lose that argument, right? And that's essentially what Peter is saying. He's saying, hey guys, if God called me to speak to these Gentiles, if the Holy Spirit is descending upon them and inspiring faith in them, who am I to say no? And I love that then the, the response from the Jewish leaders who were contentious, right? After hearing this well-reasoned thing, something that this doesn't happen in the modern age, right? Like they had a strong point of view and the guy came back with their bottle and they went, you're right, okay, good. <laughs> they actually changed their opinion. That doesn't happen these days. Um, but they basically said, praise God, I guess now the Gentiles are part of the church too. Cool, let's figure out what that means. Now I bring all this up. Because, as I have mentioned in sermons before, Lutherans have a unique relationship with the Holy Spirit. We understand the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We recognize that the Holy Spirit inspires faith within us. But sometimes the Lutheran Church has a hard time kind of acknowledging that and leaning into that. See, especially within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, we're very academic synod. Very intelligent. Our seminary process is longer than pretty much any other denomination in the United States. Uh, in order to become a pastor, you have to go through more intense schooling than anywhere else. I remember when I was in seminary reading about, <laughs> reading about a Baptist preacher who was eight years old. And they're like, wow, what an amazing pastor he is. And I'm like, I've been in college for eight years. Wish I could have done that. Saved me a lot of time and frustration. And, and to be honest, that education is profound, it is impactful, it helps you to really have a deep understanding of the things that we don't know, but it also tends to lean itself into us having an intellectual faith. We like a faith that we can understand. We like a faith that we can read about, that we can, we can analyze, that we can research that has empirical evidence. We like a faith where we can look at the historical evidence and say, yep, this is Jesus of Nazareth. There's historical evidence that points to this. This is creation. You can look within science and see this. We like that, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, that ain't him. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is not empirical. He's not academic. He's hard to wrap his arms around. I really shouldn't be ascribing the pronoun he to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a mystery. The Holy Spirit works in ways that we just can't understand. And so we see Peter, who's saying, yeah, I don't really understand it. I feel like Scripture said to go the other direction. But if the Holy Spirit's telling me to go this way, I'm not going to argue with him. And in the Lutheran Church, we're kind of like on the side of the Jewish leaders at the time. We're like, yeah, but, but the Bible. <laughs> but this is what Scripture says. This is what the book says. I read this. I researched this. I, I memorized this back for confirmation. I, I don't understand how this is different now. And we just have to say the Holy Spirit can do powerful things. We want a God that we can understand, but that ain't going to be the Holy Spirit. And just think about it. In Scripture, he, he's like or the Holy Spirit is like a dove, not a dove. We often depicted the Holy Spirit as a literal dove, but it says like a dove. Uh, is tongues of fire, like little bits, like that's just such a strange turn of phrase that we've gotten used to. But like there's these little flames that appear and suddenly they have the ability to speak in different languages that people can understand. The Holy Spirit is a mystery, sometimes a wind, sometimes just a simple feeling of peace. That's why we sometimes struggle with him. But who are we to stand in God's way? 
Who are we to try and put God into a box and say, no, no, we need a God that we can understand. Who are we to say, Holy Spirit, we don't fully grasp what you're all about, so we're really going to focus more on Jesus. And don't get me wrong, Jesus is the one who, who sanctifies, right? Jesus is the, or is the one who justifies. Jesus is the one whose work on the cross sets us free and gives us that grace. The, the Father creates us, but it's the Holy Spirit that inspires that faith that connects us with all of that. And that can be difficult for us to, to wrap our minds around. Here's the thing. When it comes down to it, the Holy Spirit's a little scary. Because the Holy Spirit asks dangerous questions. The Holy Spirit asks questions like, what do you actually believe? You can come to church every Sunday. What do you actually believe in your heart? Not what do you know. Not what do you academically understand. But what do you trust? What do you believe? The Holy Spirit asks questions like, oh, you, you see this problem in the world. What are you doing about it? How are you responding to it? The Holy Spirit asks us questions like, hey, why aren't you loving like God told you how to love? Why aren't you sharing the compassion that we saw modeled in Jesus, who was the perfect example of love? See, the Holy Spirit asks some scary and dangerous questions that cause us to have that existential crisis as people who, who have made part of our identity to be Christians. So, what does the Holy Spirit do for us? When we say God is with you, that's the Holy Spirit. When we say that God has brought faith in you, when we say God will bring peace to you, that's the Holy Spirit. It means that when you're sitting in that cold and stale, sterile room, sitting on that crinkly paper waiting for the doctor to come back with results, God is with you. It means when you're laying in bed staring at the ceiling and you can hear your spouse sleeping next to you and you're rolling through all those stresses, that to-do list, those bills and that deficit in your bank account, God is with you. It means after you have finally picked up the phone to call that person and it's ringing and you hear their voice say hello and you're reminded that the last time you spoke, it ended in a fight. God is with you. It means as you sit and you say, God, how are you present in this situation? I don't see you. I don't understand you. I don't understand how this is happening. I don't understand what you're doing. God is with you. Maybe he's a mystery. Maybe we don't fully understand yet, but we know, we know that God is with us because the Holy Spirit is powerful and is at work in strange and mysterious ways that, that we, with our limited understanding, with our limited brain capacity, can't understand. I was listening to a preacher, and she shared that um, it doesn't matter your capacity. What matters is his compassion. I think that we often limit God far too often. We, we look at God and we say, I need to understand you. I need to, to comprehend you. you. God, this is what you do in my life. I, I'm able to come to church and experience God, but God is with you in the midst of all of those things. God is with you through the Holy Spirit. And as we look at Revelation, we see this beautiful statement of what is yet to come. The old has gone and the new has come. The, the, the new heaven and the new earth, free of mourning, free of pain, free of sorrow. Because sometimes the greatest gifts that we'll encounter as we wander through the wilderness are on the other side of a river of tears. And God guides us through that. The Holy Spirit walks us along that river, walks us through that river to understand the joy that is waiting through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit inspires us when we finally have that conversation. Maybe you get a haircut on Saturday and the barber says, hey, you got any big plans for tomorrow? And suddenly your heart's pounding a little bit and you're sweating a little bit and you, you actually start sharing your faith. The Holy Spirit's working there. Helping somebody who maybe has no hope, who's full of fear, who's full of anxiety, who's full of uncertainty, who's only heard about a God that you have to understand. The Holy Spirit's at work there. So as you go out this week, as you encounter the turmoil, as you encounter the sorrows of this broken world, as you encounter how difficult this world can be to comprehend and understand, my prayer is that you know that God is with you. 
that you've been set free, that we have yet coming a new creation that is full of joy. Joy after sorrow, after the sorrow and pain of this world. There is something better coming. And you may not understand it in this world with its hurts, but it is coming, my friends. As you go out this week, I pray that you have the strength to cross through that river of tears. I pray that you have the strength to know that even though you may not see, may not understand, may not comprehend that God is with you. My friends, let's respond to the challenge of God to say, who are we to stand in the way? This week, as we live our lives, let's leave room for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now if you'll join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today and we ask that you would inspire us. Lord, help us to recognize that, that intelligent, intellectual study of your scripture and of you is great. It is powerful. It helps us to understand you more, but Lord, it is not comprehensive. Lord, there is a mystery to you that we'll never understand. And so, Lord, I pray that you are with us, whatever that means, Lord. Lord, we trust in you. Help us to even grasp on to what that means. Help us to move beyond just an intellectual understanding of our God and our Lord and move to a more spiritual, more metaphorical, so that we may come to know you and have a relationship with you, Lord, through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray for every single person in this room, those watching online, that you would work in them, that you would work through them, to help them to know hope and to help them to deliver hope to the people in this world who don't know hope. Lord, you inspire each and every one of us and in your own unique way. And I pray that you would help us to be a force to be reckoned with in this world and in this community. Help us to not shy away from those dangerous questions that we may come to know you more and come to know ourselves more. And Lord, because we live in this broken world as we experience those sorrows and those hurts that we know that one day will pass away, but it doesn't make it any easier right now. Lord, there are those who have requested prayers. And so we raise them up to you here now. Lord, you know what's going on in the lives of the people here on this list. And so we raise them up to you. We pray for Cheryl and for Gloria, for Rosemary, for Wanda, for Clyde and for Sue Ford. For Kirsten and Jerry, for Judy and Donna and Dawn, for Jeffrey and Joanne, for Kristen and Ruth, for Shirley and Bill, for Roxy, for Meryl and for Monique. Lord, you know what's going on and you know how you can enter into those lives, but we ask that you would ease their pain physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And Lord, I also know that that list is not complete. I know that there are other people who need prayers, who need your intercession. And so we ask that you would be with them as well. Lord, as you walked on this earth, as you saw, as people experience sorrow that will eventually lead to joy, as we experience a, a lack of understanding that will eventually lead to clarity, Lord, you taught us a prayer, a prayer that says it all. And so here now in this place, we get to join together not just with the people in this room or watching online, but with all the saints who have gone before us, speaking in all their different languages, with all their different backgrounds. We pray that very same prayer that passed over the lips of our Lord. We pray together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to continue now in worship by first recognizing that God has blessed each and every one of us. And we first see those blessings, but then once we recognize that the blessings, that everything we have is from God, we can then give some back to him, not to pat ourselves on the back, but instead so that he can use them in the way that only God can, and that is to bring hope, to bring providence to the people of our community. And so we continue and worship now by gathering our offering to God.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the very night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. For the forgiveness of all your sins, do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. I just want to say we take this moment very seriously. We recognize that from our limited perspective, we don't understand it, right? We don't comprehend what's happening, but somehow the Holy Spirit is bringing the presence of God to us through this bread and wine, this body and blood. Uh, we also recognize that as we approach this altar, we need forgiveness, that we are sinful at our very nature, and that the only way for that sin to be washed away, to be forgiven, is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you hear those words and you agree with that statement, by all means, when your row is dismissed, come forward, share in this moment, share in this miracle with us. If you have some questions or some doubts, that's okay. Uh, we still invite you to come forward, just ask you cross your arms like this. I'd love to offer you a blessing and answer any questions you may have after the service. With that being said, we begin now by serving those who serve us.
And now may this eating and drinking of Christ's true body and true blood strengthen you and preserve you from this life through life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace and joy. Christ has set you free. Please stand. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We close out with our closing hymn, 818, In Thee Is Gladness. <laughs>